back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. It's the minimum wage massacre. We got that story, plus some good news about the boob tube. But first, I think continuing last week's look at deep state-sponsored terror that doesn't really care about your silly little party affiliations is a good way to begin this episode 300 of New World Next Week. Mexican drug king worked for the CIA, says his son, this via Washington's blog in a brand new book, the son of Medellin drug king Pablo Escobar says that his father worked for the CIA. And there is a link in there to the English translation. Of course, everything that we say in sight is always listed down in the show notes. Does this sound like crazy conspiracy theories? Let's go to the crazy conspiracy place called Time Magazine, where they reported, quote, the U.S. government allowed the Mexican Sinaloa drug cartel to carry out its business unimpeded between 2000 and 2012 in exchange for information on rival cartels. An investigation by El Universal claims, end quote, how about Business Insider? Quote, there have long been allegations the world's most powerful drug trafficker coordinates with American authorities. But the El Universal investigation is the first to publish court documents that include corroborating testimony from a DEA agent and a Justice Department official, end quote. How about Fox News? Quote, according to the motion, the deal was part of a divide and conquer strategy where the U.S. helped finance and arm the Sinaloa cartel, though through Operation Fast and Furious, in exchange for information that allowed the DEA and FBI to destroy and dismantle rival Mexican cartels, end quote. Hey, how about Salon? Quote, it has been revealed the U.S. government has been enabling billions of dollars worth of drugs to flood into the country from Mexico because of shady deals with the notorious Sinaloa cartel, end quote. Furthermore, it's worth noting that agents for the Drug Enforcement Agency had dozens of sex parties with prostitutes hired by the drug cartels they were supposed to stop. They also got money, gifts, and weapons. Drug enforcement agents also ran New Jersey's sleaziest strip club using illegal, undocumented girls, which included a prostitution ring. And finally, even Nixon's chief policy officer, John Ehrlichman, said that the war on drugs was launched as an excuse to attack the anti-war left and blacks. So, like Gil Scott Heron said, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell, and Dean, it follows a pattern if you dig what I mean. So I think mission accomplished there, at least on the uh, late anti-war left, as they are extinct as a dodo. James, this kind of continues our, our, our look last week at CIA blind shake. That's right. And it's a uh, continuation of the CIA and the drug trade. I had that 2011 eye-opener report that I just recently posted up to my Corporate Report Extras channel that I hope people will check out because it contains a lot of this information, including a conversation that I conducted back in 2011 with Bill Conroy of Narco News about the case of Jesus Vicente uh, Zambada Niebla of the Sinaloa drug cartel, who was up on charges for of drug trafficking, importing tons of cocaine into the U.S. He was the logistical coordinator for the in a lower cartel who pleaded in court saying, hey guys, I, I was working with intelligence agencies. You, you guys set me up. And uh, they invoked uh, classified information procedural rules to, to try to squash that. So that is up in that CIA and the drug trade mini documentary that I had uh, just, uh, again, just posted up to the Corporate Report Extras channel. And if you go and look at this actual uh, report from the George Washington's blog, he's got a bunch of different uh, YouTube videos uh, embedded there that will help make sense of some of this for people, for anyone out there in our audience who doesn't already know how the uh, the drug trade is 100% it fostered and enabled and allowed by the intelligence agencies who use it for their own fun and profit in many different ways. And uh, it's good to know that now that tr- our Lord and Savior Trump is in office, the drug war is coming to an end, right? Right, James? Oh, I'm, I'm sure it's going to come to an end, except... It's absolutely not, as as Sessions has already kind of intimated, and this is probably going to be one of the bigger battles that's increasing. And as long as we're talking about, you know, the, the deep state rolling on and the agenda not caring about a little R or a little D, we'll continue to fill the swamp and note that Trump wants a record $54 billion increase in military spending. That's on top of, I think, the near $600 billion that we already spend. So, Change Alleluia, hope and change, drain the swamp, pick your slogan, the deep state rolls on. 
Let's move to our second story this week on New World Next Week, where we move to Zero Hedge and Dispatch.com as the minimum wage massacre continues. This is maybe the sequel. It'll probably have as many sequels as any bad horror movie franchise will, as Wendy's unleashes a thousand robots to counter higher labor costs. In yet another awkwardly rational response to government intervention in deciding what's fair, the blowback from minimum wage demanding fast food workers has struck again. Wendy's plans to install self-ordering kiosks in a thousand of its stores. That's 16 percent of its locations U.S.-wide. Last year was tough. Five percent wage inflation, said Bob Wright, Wendy's chief operating officer, during his presentation to investors and analysts last week. He added that the company expects wages to rise four percent in 2017. But the real question is, what are we doing about it? Wright noted that over the past two years, Wendy's has figured out how to eliminate 31 hours of labor per week from its restaurants and is now working to use technology such as kiosks to increase efficiency. Meanwhile, Wendy's chief information officer, David Trim, said the kiosks are intended to appeal to younger customers and reduce labor costs. Kiosks also allow customers of the fast food giant to circumvent long lines during peak dining hours while increasing kitchen production. The Dublin-based burger giant, I believe that's Dublin, Ohio, burger giant started offering kiosks last year, and demand for the technology has been high from both customers and franchise owners. And the article goes on to basically talk about the increase in how many of these franchises are super stoked to lay off all kinds of $15 an hour employees so they can get new touchscreens. James? You know, it's interesting to look at the responses to this story in the comments and on Twitter and other places, because people raise the important point. Of course, here we have Bob Wright, the CEO of Wendy's, explicitly tying this to wage inflation, saying basically these minimum wage workers cost too much. It'll be cheaper. I think they they estimate it'll be two years before all of these kiosks kiosks pay for themselves because they won't be paying these minimum wage uh, order takers anymore. And... Uh, So it's explicitly tied to that. But the point is made, and I think it's a valid one, these kiosks and this automation is happening regardless of whatever wage price these minimum wage workers are working at, whether it's $15 or $5 an hour, it's still, they're going to be doing this eventually, because in the long run, in whatever time frame, it will pay for itself. So I'm not sure that they're, I mean, yeah, I get the, I mean, really, honestly, minimum wage, at, uh, raising it higher and higher is, uh, and expecting that that will be an economic benefit to the poorest people rather than finding ways uh, for their jobs to be eliminated is economic pipe dreams. Why don't we just make the minimum wage of $1,000 an hour? Everyone will be rich. Um, but uh, yeah, you learn some basic economics, people. But but the point is still there that this automation is coming. And it's one of those stories where there's a, a deeper societal message and, and, and problem here, which is that, well, we don't want people to do silly, ro- repetitive, robotic tasks that they hate, that has no, I mean, no value to them in their life. That is not a way to earn a living, and we shouldn't expect people to do that as a way to earn a living, and we shouldn't want people to want those types of jobs. And yet, of course, when this automation comes in that transition period until whatever comes along that might fill up that gap of the uh, the lowest people on the economic ladder um, jobs, well, those people are going to be crushed under this bus. And uh, what do you do about that? And, uh, you know, Bill Gates and others are saying we got to tax the robots. So is that the answer? Basic income? Universal basic income? Again, I think uh, learning some basic economics might help with uh, dispelling some of that myth. But still, there is a genuine problem here. And uh, I don't think it's an easily soluble one. Um, certainly not with this, the uh, the toolbox that's on the table right now. So it's one hell of a important story. And as as we've been talking about quite a bit in the last year or two, um, I think this is going to be a bigger and bigger story for more and more people over the coming years. Mm-hmm. James, you took the Bill Gates update there just <laughs> right out of my notes. So we'll include that in the show notes as well. And I got a few other technocracy updates that we'll include here as related. Friendface testing artificial intelligence to spot potentially suicidal members. Sorry, suicidal Friendface users abroad. This tool is only available in Trollmerica at the moment. Google can, which means they will, and which means they did remotely reset your Google router. And shocker, stuffed cloud pets toys leak millions of photos, voice recordings, and personal information 
from kids and parents. Another warning that the Internet of Things is a giant pie cloud in the sky disaster. <laughs> so let's wrap up this episode 300 of New World next week with a little bit of good news. Americans have fewer TVs on average than they did in 2009. This comes via Ars Technica. Americans went from having an average of 2.6 TVs per household in 2009 to having 2.3 TVs in 2015, according to survey data from the U.S. Energy Information Agency, EIA. The data comes from the agency's Residential Energy Consumption Survey, and allegedly a more fine, detailed report on this survey is actually coming out in April. So just some of the bits and pieces are available right now. The latest data shows that in 2015, 2.6% of households had no TV at all, a jump from the previous four surveys in 2009, 2005, 2001, and 1997, in which a steady 1.2 to 1.3% of households didn't own a TV at all. James, I really like this story for our 300th episode. Americans have fewer TVs on average than they did in 2009 because that's when we started New World Next Week in October of 2009, I believe. And it is a pleasure here to be with you. I know you had the tie on last week. I'll wear the tie this week to celebrate the, doing this work for so long. Now, James, if there's anything I've learned from the holy religious dogma of catastrophic anthropogenic global warming, it is that correlation equals causation. There is no doubt if if uh, CO2 goes from 350 ppm to 400 ppm and over that time period, the global average temperature, however you quite work that out, it goes up one one hundredth of a degree. It is because of that CO2 increase. No doubt. Settled science. One hundred percent. Therefore, if New World Next Week starts in 2009 and over that seven, eight, almost eight year period, uh, people start ditching their TVs in record numbers. It is because of New World Next Week. So I'm going to give ourselves a big pat on the back. We did it. We are getting the American populace to tune out their TVs and tune into real independent media. So thank you, James, for being part of that. And thank you to all you guys out there for helping to spread the word about this. The the show, the internet series that is causing people to ditch their TVs. (laughs) <laughs> this is the one. New World Next Week. We have been here since October 2009. 300 episodes, give or take a couple of ones that we screwed up and there wasn't video for, so we just released them as audio-only episodes. They don't, those don't count as canon New World Next Week episodes, but they're all up there on the archives. Our sites both individually have tens of thousands of articles and interviews and episodes, and we've done it completely listener-supported since then. So hopefully here, 300 more episodes. I'll implore people and thank them for supporting our work via Patreon. I really enjoy Patreon as a nice way for for people to give that support. There's nothing better I enjoy seeing. I get two emails kind of in a row. One will say, hey, Joe canceled his PayPal donations to you. I go, oh, man. And then the next email says, Joe set up a new Patreon account. <laughs> Sweet. That's been the fantastic way that that's been going. And again, that's that's the way we'll continue to do this independent work, James. We certainly will for at least 300 more, but let's make sure there's a lot of good news in there as well. So thank you again for three great stories. Thank you, buddy. Take care. <laughs>